Designing the largest airliner in the world demands years of intensive and exacting work and risking billions of euros on one of the most challenging aviation projects ever. All over Europe, 50,000 people, including 6,000 engineers, work on the program at 15 production sites. As tall as an eight-floor building, three million spare parts, a wingspan of 80 meters, a takeoff weight of 560 tons, and capacity to carry up to 800 passengers, the A380 is by far the largest airliner ever built. In April 2005, this giant of the skies made commercial aviation history with its first flight. Next came the aircraft's certification by the American and European authorities. 2,500 hours of flight tests in all weather conditions to prove that the A380 is a reliable and safe aeroplane ready for commercial entry into service. To log up the 2,500 flight hours required for certification, some 80 engineers and technicians and 25 test pilots are mobilized. With 20 tons of onboard test flight calculators, they will take the A380 on flights lasting from 2 to 10 hours. MSN-1, the first prototype, the fruit of five years of research and development, will be used to put the theories to the test, exploring every possible aspect of the aircraft in flight. He's gentil, lui, hein? It's going to be nice to see where the answer is. Bon. Tu me diras euh, si c'est soir le tard le soir, il n'y a personne ici. Non, ah, hein, donc on va faire de la fumée haute, ce soir. J'ai comme l'impression qu'on va. Oui, si non, ça se fait, voilà. ça va se faire tard. Oui. Hein ah oui, oui, ton impression est bonne. Hein, faut, faut être... voilà. Allez, Alors écoute. Je suis. I am what they call the little Jesus. The little Jesus is the onboard flight engineer, and he's called the little Jesus because he sits in the third seat between the ox and the donkey. He's what you may call a rarity because flight engineers are a dying breed and have more or less disappeared from airline service, except in flight tests where test flight engineers are still needed. So the flight test mechanic is in the cockpit. He supports the pilots in all the aircraft's onboard systems operations. Our job is to make sure there are no problems and that the carrier itself, all aircraft systems and accessories are transparent during aircraft operation. When we start the engines, they should start. If we push the throttle forward, we should have thrust. When we pull the stick back, it should take off. And everything that's behind that, calculators, computers, hydraulics and electricity, should be totally transparent to the user. So that's our job, to make the plane simple. It's true that to make a plane simple is super complicated. But these are engineers with 15 or 20 years training. This place is full of very brainy people. So 
barrer, vas-y. Pourquoi il est pas déçu Ah oui, vous l'avez mis, euh, d'accord, il a marqué X. I'm a test pilot and a chief test pilot, which means I organize the schedules for the test pilots and designate the crews. A test pilot's job is to prepare the aircraft for the airline pilots. In other words, the test pilot tries to adapt the plane to the airline pilot's needs. Then the airline pilot must adapt to the aircraft. When you're a test pilot, you mustn't love planes too much. I mean, you love them, but not passionately. Like you love a woman because she's got a certain something. No, you mustn't forgive or tolerate anything. You have to be very demanding, and so I excuse nothing on the 380. I'm very clear about everything I don't like. I get cross, I tell the engineers, and I don't give up until I get what I want. Each morning at 6, the mechanics, electricians and quality controllers power up every one of the plane's electrical circuits. A complete two and a half hour checklist reviews every system on board. Flight commands, test installations, spoilers, rudders, landing gear. The prototype must be fully operational every morning. For the flight test center, the plane must fly every day. Hello? Can we pull on the brakes? Take the parking brake off? Hang on, I better warn them in case it moves a bit. There are trucks everywhere, but in case it budges, I'll warn them. Right, so I'm pressing on the brakes. I'm wearing an orange flying suit today because we're going to do a flight with vibrations. It's a risky flight because we're outside the flight envelope. So the basic precautions require wearing safety equipment, which means we can evacuate the aircraft if there's a problem, if we lose control or something. So it's more for reassurance to reassure the authorities more than us, because if we did lose control, I don't think we'd be able to evacuate the plane anyway. So we carry parachutes, a lifeboat, we wear helmets. A helmet can be useful when we are bumped around, stops us getting too many knocks. Anyway, if we did have to evacuate a plane like this, a prototype, I think the main reason would be a fire on board rather than loss of control. If we lost control, I don't see how we could make it from the cockpit to the evacuation hatch 30 feet behind, even with a handrail, if we're upside down. Although seemingly less spectacular than in the past, the flight test phase enables engineers to shed light on grey areas and to put simulations up against in-flight reality. Airline pilots are not exposed to these extremes. It's up to the test crews to explore them and define the limits. A morning in September. Gérard Desbois, Jacques Rosé and the flight test engineers are on board the prototype for the flutter test, a vibration test considered far more dangerous than the A380's first flight. This type of flight is graded high risk. Only the most experienced pilots and engineers can perform this test. Oui. Oui. 
It's a flutter flight. We're going to take off with the uh, heaviest payload ever, 561 and a bit tons. And we're going to flutter with a very heavy plane and the wings full of kerosene. Then we're going to do some stalls with the spoilers out a bit. Then we have a new braking system that we'll try out at the end. You know, when they take off, when the wheels are up, I almost feel as if I'm sitting in the back, especially when I know it's a pretty risky flight. It's a little like sharing the risks on the ground. It's true, I'm not in any danger sitting here at my desk, but I'm still with them. We can't wait for them to get back and weigh up what was good or not so good and what went well. The most critical tests are those focusing on the plane's structure. Pilots and engineers evaluate the aircraft's behavior during sudden accelerations. If the plane's design is flawed, Vibrations would affect the handling, damage its structure, and could even destroy it. During this high-risk flight, shock waves are applied to the rudders and ailerons for up to six minutes at a time. Today's flight is one of many vibration tests. We make the aircraft vibrate to establish its flight envelope, see how it reacts. We go outside the flight envelope specified for airline use, and it's our job to make sure these margins are effectively safe. We have to go to a given flight point a conjunction of Mach number and altitude, and send vibrations onto the structure to see how it absorbs them. The exercise is to reach that point without going beyond it, as beyond it there are no guarantees. You have to start where you're sure nothing will happen. Once you're comfortable there, you go a little bit further. You have to always start where you know it'll be fine. There are some areas that are so borderline and so extreme that the only way to validate calculations is to actually do the test. I've been flying planes for 35 years, and one of the secrets is to never ever get carried away. In other words, on board, during the flight, you mustn't enjoy it too much. Once you start thinking how great it is, you have to be careful. Only afterwards, when the flight is over and you look back and see what you've done, can you really enjoy it. You can say, I flew well, I stayed within the safety limits, I did exactly what I wanted to do, and I'm very happy. But during the flight, you have to stay almost sad. Uh, 
Apparently he likes it up there. He doesn't want to come down. I was fortunate enough to start with Concorde, and now I hope to finish on this one. And I was lucky too. Well, I call it luck, others disagree, to have worked on the structure and on systems, and now I'm finishing on the runway. It's not bad, I like it. It feels like a good ending. All the equipment has arrived in Istres. Everything's unloaded, and as you can see, we've bought a lot of equipment. This is a part of what's needed for flight preparation, and the rest is in case the aircraft leaves the runway during the flooded runway test, and we have to put it back onto the tarmac to take it back to Toulouse. We're waiting for the plane to land. This afternoon we'll have the debriefing, and tomorrow we'll do the test. With its five kilometers of tarmac, the airfield at Istres in southern France has the longest runway in Europe, long enough for NASA's shuttle to use for an emergency landing. The swimming pool test requires the aircraft to run at various speeds in 10 centimeters of water. This simulates an aircraft landing on a flooded runway. On board, engineers will verify that the engines don't flood and, above all, that the braking system remains totally operational. We have to show that the plane can land here is just a few feet of leeway either side. That's the problem. Can we repair it? Oh dear, oh dear. Didn't he bring four spare brake pipes? Okay, I'm on my way back. What's up? Is there a problem? Yes. What is it? We've broken a feed tube on a brake block. Broken a tube on a brake block? Brake power supply. We'll see if we can fix the bug, but we'll have to trim. You see, the pressure was here, on these parts. The support was pushed up and backwards, and look, it snapped this tube here. Because of it, the cables here are really stretched and flattened out. It's not too bad, but have a look. Here we've got a huge leak. That's not so good. There's a broken part at the rear of the main right landing gear. It's a hydraulic support for the brakes, which is badly placed. So it'll have to be completely redesigned and retested afterwards. So it's clearly a little engineering problem that will have to be remedied. 
But flight tests are for just that. We do flight tests and you can't foresee everything. We can anticipate certain things, which is why we bring all this equipment. But then we get set back by a little thing, which completely scuppers the test. Moving a plane this size is costly, and the engineers must have efficient maintenance solutions ready. The aircraft must be certified on time. Here at East, the test program allows no let-up. The VMU test requires the A380 to take off at its lowest possible speed. A clamp mounted at the rear of the plane will help avoid any damage to the tail. The aim is to determine the minimum speed at which the aircraft can lift off the ground. The minimum speed is when the tail drags along the ground and as the tail is on the ground, the angle of incidence is constant. It's equal to the trim angle of the aircraft and as we accelerate with the same incidence, the wings give more and more lift until the lift equals the weight of the plane and the plane takes off. That is the minimum unstick speed, which is the very minimum takeoff speed. authorities to prove that the aircraft can take off from a short runway. The tests run non-stop, all year round. Aerodynamics, coupling devices, systems, a long, meticulous process, leaving the engineers, mechanics and pilots with very little rest or time off. The pressure is on, but the aircraft must fly every day. I don't know if I'm coming or going. Having flown Saturday and Sunday, I've lost track of time. I thought today was Monday, and it's actually Tuesday. Incredible. Well, you keep going. It's stressful. The aircraft breaks down or doesn't work properly. Like this morning, the start of the day was a bit messy. We nearly took off. We didn't take off, we came back, sorted out the problem, set off again. In the end, everything went well. Tomorrow's another day. Okay, guys, can we go or not? Hang on, Serge, when it's locked, when the jack is locked, there's no strain on it? There's no strain, so close up and let's go. Well, you have to be practical. There's no strain on the handle when it's locked. So we lock the reverse of cowling and we go. Otherwise, we'll never make it. We've got to go, guys. We've got 15 laps to do. We. Yep. Yeah. Shall I start the APU? Affirmative. There are 2,500 hours of flight tests on four prototypes, of which two are heavily equipped with measuring instruments. So we're going to be testing for quite some time. It's far from over. It's just the start. The plane made its first flight on the 27th of April, so that's five months full testing on just one prototype. This is just the beginning.